Get a Book Dot Today presents For the Honor of the Captain, Book Two in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2019. He is Shane Lachlan Black, the Internet's original stunt writer. The very best way to support the Starship's universe is to head over to our bookstore and grab your very own copy of our title of the day or any one of the other 28 premium quality science fiction ebooks and audiobooks available now. Why support the channel? Because we're just getting started. The sixth novel in the Starships at War series is on its way, along with Upon a Pale Horse, book three in the Destroy All Starship series. Book sales? Keep me writing. I can produce over 6,000 words of published quality fiction a day at full speed. I can write a novella in a week, a novel in two. My store has a series of five novels with over 2,000 pages of critically acclaimed military science fiction you can get right now for the cost of a medium pizza. If it's exciting, it's happening here. If it's fun, it was our idea. If it's new, we got there first. If you want to be part of what happens when pages turn, join us. Together, we can make great things happen. Say it with me. All ahead, battle speed. Chapter 11. Commander, we have a boatload of mysteries on this station, ma'am, and we can't investigate until we can get to the primary communications deck and let my techs examine the station logs. Have you located any survivors? Commander Hunter asked. Any residuals from approaching ships? We have one Proximan crew member. We discovered him in a control cabin on this deck. It was about the same time we encountered the unexplained temperature decreases. We were on our way to locate the source of the other life signs when we were attacked by unidentified forces. So far, they haven't pursued us, but we don't have the firepower to break through their lines on the next deck up. We're also being jammed, ma'am, Corporal Overs added. Short-range, high-energy transmitters. Where is their ship? Hunter asked. We have no enemy contacts anywhere near here. Unknown. Their ship may be waiting somewhere nearby, Islington replied. Perhaps they chose to leave the area to avoid detection. But where is the jamming signal coming from? Overs asked rhetorically. Well, we're not going to get any answers standing around here speculating, Hunter said. Let's go see our Proximan friend and find out if there's anything he can tell us about recent events. Sergeant, secure this deck. Report any unusual life signs readings the moment you detect them. There are hostels aboard this station, so keep it tight and travel by teams only. Aye, ma'am. Sergeant Benning nodded to his men and they filed out of the airlock into the station corridor. Jace activated her comlink. Hunter to Fury. Fury, Huggins. Maintain alert condition one, Tom. There's something going on around here and I don't like it one bit. Have Josiah put Minstrel into a patrol course a thousand clicks out until further instructed. Acknowledged landing party. Hunter collected an Atmos from her survey technician and led the group towards the operations station. Islington was a little more confident now that she had some manpower to address the threat of the alien attackers on the station. She was still confused, however. Any species with the technology to not only overcome a Proximan station crew, but jam the short-range communications of an Alliance landing party, must have had the wherewithal to engage and defeat what amounts to an understrength squad of fleet marines. After driving off her group's advance, why didn't they attack? Meanwhile, why were they getting contradictory life signs readings? First, it was a station full of Proximans. Next, there are no readings at all. Then they get intermittent and indeterminate readings from multiple vantage points. Captain Islington was beginning to wonder if someone were playing a practical joke. Biological analysis units operated on rather mundane and routine scientific principles. It would take an enormous amount of effort to cause them to see things that weren't there. Hunter's medic and Corporal Gray both attended to the Proximan operations tech. By now it appeared the rather thin and agile-looking humanoid feline was stabilized. Cold temperatures didn't seem to be hazardous for the cat race, but it was clear they were more comfortable in warmer temperatures. Moderate atmosphere conditions had been restored for the most part on the station's lowest deck. So far, none of the technicians had been able to get any useful information about what was going on anywhere else on the station. Short-range communications weren't being jammed anymore, but that wasn't doing anything for their man-portable sensors 
or those aboard Fury either, for the most part. There were life signs, but none of the Skywatch electronics could tell any of the officers what they were, how many were present, or what their current locations were. There wasn't even a way to reliably chart a safe path from one place to the next. All Hunter and Islington knew was they could hold Deck 30. Islington switched off her handheld in frustration. I can't get any definitive readings. None of us can. Hunter glanced at the unconscious Proximan. It looks like any new or useful information we get is going to have to come from him. Chapter 12 It had been a number of years since Admiral Benjamin Powers had hurried from one place to the next at Skywatch Command. The fleet's primary base of operations on Corps Prime was home to more than 10,000 personnel in charge of dozens of sprawling commands. The four banner fleets operated by Skywatch had more or less easily understood command hierarchies. Powers sat atop the one for the Southern Banner. <laughs> the Blue Fleet, as it had come to be known over the years, was the second oldest permanent fleet command. Powers was its commander-in-chief, answering only to Commander Skywatch. His four-star billet had been occupied by 31 other men and four women over the last 180 years. Southern Banner was a core-level command, with no fewer than seven full-size battle groups and five divisions of Marines under arms. It was responsible for deep space defense primarily in regions beyond the Gitarn Reach, like Kraken and Galfos. It was one of those regions which was responsible for the higher-than-average walking speed of a certain admiral on this fine, starry morning. The division sergeant at the hatch saluted as the admiral and his chief of staff entered the nerve center of Corps Three's fleet base. Report. And Commander Eric Tyndall gathered what he could of the readouts he had been studying for the last three hours and plopped the latest telemetry and coded communications on top of the stack. He carried them from the control bank to the conference table and managed not to drop anything despite the bundle's unwieldy shape. He spread everything out on the table and turned one of the monitors so the Admiral could see it. Sir, we have confirmation of our earlier theory. It's not just Kraken this time. We have enemy activity near Omicron 474. That's ridiculous. Why would anyone... Powers motioned for Captain Crowell to hold off for a moment. Pretend I'm not the CINC. Pretend I'm a civilian committee. Three days ago, this was a diplomatic argument in an isolated star system. Now you're talking about theater-wide fleet ops. Tell me a story that makes sense this time. Sir, I understand your time constraints, and I understand this is the fourth time you've been invited here, but... Get to the point, Commander, Crowell growled. We have confirmed the Imperial Fleet activity we detected in the Atlantis region, sir. General Aulis ordered the Marine Platoon aboard DSS Matador to commandeer Repeater 1 in the Kraken region and outfit it with new power sources, a laser relay antenna, and a direct frequency interrupt for the Descartes jump gate. We got the first batch of telemetry this morning. Tyndall activated the view screen. A tactical map of the Kraken region appeared with Repeater 1 in the center of the display. At the upper edge, the map displayed the location of the Omicron 474 Supermassive Singularity, which was the major landmark at the boundary between the Kraken Expanse and the Atlantis region. Only six light hours from the Singularity, a red icon marked the location of a Sarn battle group. Further along the course to Mycenae Seti, a freestanding Sarn battle station was also marked. A battle station, Powers muttered. They're building a protected corridor directly to Atlantis. Crowell added. With respect, sir, we believe they are building a corridor from Atlantis, Tyndall replied. But there's nothing there. We don't know that for sure, Captain. Atlantis has been off-limits to Skywatch ships and crews since the Akane incident. Technically, we're violating regulations by directing specialized scanners at it like this. Could this be the source of their new weapons? Powers asked. Are they reinforcing from Atlantis and preparing to use those new fleet formations against m -Sedi? Tyndall slid the tactical display until the Atlantis region was on one side and the Galfos region was on another. If they had somehow found an allied fleet in the Atlantis region, they could be supplying them from their home planets here. They move their fleet elements into Atlantis, rearm or resupply them, then bring them through this new corridor to MCT. Where they can stage a full-scale fleet invasion of core space, Crowell finished for the commander. Most unsettling, sir. Tyndall replied in a typical analytical tone. Commodore Wilkes has a report for you as well, and he is prepared to forward his intelligence and analysis to Admiral Hafnitz and Strike Fleet Hera. We're going to need to get a heads-up to Hunter and Argent's group as well.
Powers said as he gathered up his folio and key disc. Notify the Commodore I will brief Halfnets personally. Consider this information classified until further instructed. It's really no trouble, sir. He is prepared to transmit the information as part of his regular... I'll handle it, Commander, Powers said, making direct eye contact. Thank you for the information. Aye, sir, Tyndall said quietly as the two men strode towards the double doors. Keep this quiet and get word to Hafnit so she knows what she's dealing with. I'll get word to Argent. They need reinforcements badly, sir. We didn't send them out there to confront a fleet action and now with the first family involved... I will appoint a theater commander this afternoon and we'll start getting infrastructure pointed in that direction. Have the section chiefs convene a strategy meeting at 1400. I have to brief Commander Skywatch. Acknowledged. Crowell and Powers turned in opposite directions, picking their way past the slower-moving personnel. Only an hour ago, the M. Seti situation was a loud argument. Now it was turning into a serious military confrontation. And what Powers had in the field wasn't close to the firepower he needed to head off whatever the Sarn had in mind. He punched the button for Allegheny Station's Deck 1, home of the highest-ranking officer in the fleet. Chapter 13 Captain Crowell had traversed the 15 yards between Allegheny Base proper and what most officers called Mahogany Row hundreds of times during his time as the Southern Banner Chief of Staff. The key reason he had been posted to such an influential position was because it was against regulations for a flag officer to serve in an administrative role under the command of another flag officer. Admirals were rare commodities in Skywatch. Anyone with the career experience, confidence, and political skill to rise to a flag rank was considered wasted in a role where they were taking orders instead of giving them. This put every captain in Skywatch into a unique position, as they were the highest-ranking officers eligible to serve on an admiral's general staff. They were also likely to become commanding officers aboard flagships and fleet executive officers for flag officers serving in the field. There weren't many true flagships underway in deep space, but for those commands that did have a significant field presence, it was very difficult to find a more productive post for officers with high ranks and ambition to match. On this particular occasion, however, Crowell was distracted. He was one of those headquarters administrators who lived by the maxim of the dismissible rumor. You hear one thing, you let it go. You hear it twice, you let it go. However, if you start hearing the same things following the same themes from acquaintance, colleague, and superior alike, you start making provision for it to become part of your everyday reality. In this instance, the new reality was the fact the Sarn Star Empire was back on the path to conquest, and if what Crowell was hearing was even partially true, they were going to get there 50 years early. Crowell had earned battlefield commissions as senior lieutenant and lieutenant commander during the first war against the Empire. He served aboard forward fleet bases and on one of his banner's toughest and most successful minesweepers. His specialty was mine capture through electronics hacking. His team had been responsible for more than 60 such captures. His fleet commendation was a result of his section's breaking of the Sarn detonator codes that had cost more than 200 other crew members and officers their lives. His practical work had even been published and taught at the Academy. But now his job was to help admirals clarify their thinking, and if a second Praetorian war was in the offing, the themes behind his remarks would have to follow a conventional path. Truth be told, Skywatch had simply outmanufactured the Empire in the build-up to First Praetorian. The war wasn't as much a match between starships and shrewd captains as it was a match between who started with the largest triluminum and carbunk claims. Skywatch had always operated under the assumption that interplanetary mining and survey operations were military missions. The Sarn relied on a patchwork of ad hoc suppliers that were almost all civilian mercenaries and freelancers. It gave the Empire wide latitude, but it also put them in an impossible situation when it came to controlling prices— all the Sarn really had to bargain with was all the as-yet-uncolonized planets beyond the Gelfo systems. They handed out land claims like they were flyers for a weekend keg party, only to discover many of those claims had the very minerals they were trying to buy on the open market for five times the normal price. This time, it didn't appear they were suffering with the same supply problems. In fact, it appeared they not only had the raw materials they needed, but a comrade fleet to help them enforce their holdings. If Skywatch confirmed they were operating out of Atlantis, it was going to create an intractable problem for Crowell's commanding officer. The captain stepped into Admiral Power's office. Ah, Sam, good timing. 
Close the door, please. Captain Crowell went straight to the Admiral's bar for two fingers of the good stuff. It was his attempt at a preemptive fallback against what he knew he was about to hear. Powers flipped his electronic tablet off and dropped the device on his desk before rubbing his eyes with both hands. Are Admirals getting any sleep these days? Crowell asked as he settled into one of the over-engineered chairs in front of the Admiral's palatial desk. Powers had repeatedly requested something more utilitarian, but the really big brass wouldn't have it. Four stars have to maintain some level of regalness, they said. To Ben Powers, that sounded like typical parochial bovine excrement promoted by the rear echelon, but he had to pick his battles. His office wasn't where he spent most of his workday anyway. So I delivered the news and my recommendation. And Commander Skywatch gave me a direct order not to investigate the Atlantis region. Powers let his elbows settle on the desk and looked his old friend right in the eye. Off the record. Powers shook his head. Nope, can't be that lucky. My orders are rather clear, naturally. It's going to be my job to protect his job. I'm going to be the last fold of the kimono. If it goes bad, I take the fall. Nice of them to just lay it out like that. Oh, the C and C can't make it explicit, but we all know what's at stake here, and if one of us has to fall on his sword, the other will be there to carry the flag. So, what do you think of Jason Hunter? Crowell took a sip and thought for a moment. He's a good man. A little unpredictable when it comes to following orders, but he's got good command instincts and a flawless jacket at this point, if you overlook the slip-up at Bayonne. Bart and the anti-alarmists wanted his sister's head, mainly to send him a warning. More than one officer has asked us why we keep sending a cybernetics technician into space in command of a ship of the line. Fortunately, I don't have to come up with formal responses to all that noise, but when things like Bayonne happen, it makes it tough. There's two sides to every story, Ben, Crowell replied. I think Hunter and his sister are fine officers. Bayonne 3 was a bitch. There's little to be gained by whining over the fact they didn't emerge without some cuts and bruises. We lost some ships. We lost some good captains and crew members. We learn from it and move on. Um, That's the approach we've been taking with these young, untested officers for a few years now. Some think it's paying off. Some want them all in the brig. I guess that's the war I've been drafted to fight. In the meantime, we've got this Sarn thing brewing, and I want some answers about what the hell is going on in Atlantis. Still off limits, Ben, Crowell said. Not a regulation, but a law passed by the Council. We're bound by it under Article 23A. You've issued your regulation warning, Captain, Powers replied with a tired grin. Now we need to put some ships where they can do the most good. Since the dust-up in the Rho Theta system, our Commerce Raider party is on an indefinite hiatus. I propose we send Hunter's squadron in and order Halfnets to relieve Argent and her mission at the Proximan station. Hunter's XO is making noises about reinforcing. They may be running into something out there more dangerous than what we've theorized up to now. All the more reason to get a handle on this, Sam. If we don't find out what the Sarn are up to and who they are in it with, and do it before they put their plan into action, we could be in serious trouble. They could hit both M. Seti and Rho Theta and put themselves on our doorstep with their supply lines 40 light years out of reach. Nobody has the full story on the Akane station. There's no way to know what could come out of that region of space. These Kraken ships might be the junk dealers of the region for all we know. Then there's the issue of that fat singularity on the edge of the expanse. We've been trying to get signals past that thing for 60 years, and all we get back is either nonsense or the kind of thing people see when they take unidentified recreational chemicals. The only way to see beyond Omicron 474 is to get beyond it. I know you've always been a bigger fan of exploration than war, but going around a navigational hazard like that could take weeks or even months. We don't have any jump gates out there. We might. We've just never seen them before. Are you suggesting someone fly blind into a jump gate that drops them into Atlantis? What if they re-emerge in Omicron's gravity well? To be fair, if the jump gate is that close, then it wouldn't last long. Fair enough, but that's theory. We haven't put this into practice yet, and we're not allowed to practice in the first place. We can't even probe that region without triggering the no-violation laws. We're going to trigger them anyway, Powers said. The look on Captain Crowell's face couldn't be adequately described as shock, more like shock combined with heart-gripping fear. It's a court-martial offense, Admiral. You're free to walk away, Sam. I'm not going to order you to break the law. 
The captain and admiral regarded each other in silence. Chapter 14 If Jason Hunter were asked to come up with one phrase to describe ships like the Bree Saw Yen, he would have replied feral efficiency. He had heard the stories told by the Proximan elders about the brutal tribal origins of the now starfaring race of what exobiologists called felinoids. Hunter had never been a fan of science's obsession with breaking complex concepts down to things that could be easily named and even more easily inserted into a military budget. His combat tours as a squadron leader had carried him and his pilots to some memorable battlefields. Each time he had encountered a Proximan ally, it made that particular moment even more remarkable. Proximan said things that humans hesitated to utter. They were a practical, no-nonsense race that understood the basic economies of life and the value of knowledge and hard work. Lord Oakshot explained it to the captain when he was holding one of his brother's cubs during a warrior's dedication ceremony. A hundred thousand warriors died so this little one could possess all their knowledge and more. How can we live with ourselves if we do not give our last drop of blood to teach him courage? Those words always stuck with Hunter. It made him consider his own role in humanity's future. To whom would he and the million men who came before him teach courage? Did humanity still have the courage to face its obligations to protect itself and mankind's legacy? Some doubted it. Hunter hadn't yet made up his mind about others, but he was confident in his own beliefs. Oakshot was right. He wouldn't be able to live with himself if he thought he had shirked his responsibility to place the highest human values in sure hands. At the moment, the particular human values DSS Argent was responsible for were in the sure hands of Captain Jason Hunter and his tough-as-nails landing party. Colonel Moody had recruited five of his best dog-block combat marines and outfitted them with capable weapons and gear. Lord Oakshot had his lieutenant and four Proximan blade warriors ready to chew dirt with the humans. Hunter wasn't concerned about the mission. Mycenae Seti-8 was the outermost planet in the arm, as human stellar cartographers called it. The M. Seti arm consisted of the four outermost planets of the system, those planets had been collected into a group largely because they were relatively similar in size and because their peculiar orbits kept them relatively close to each other for the most part. From a navigational standpoint, they were positively jam-packed into a narrow set of orbits on the outer edge of the system. No two orbits outside MCD-4 were more than 16 million miles apart. The outer bodies like MCD-7 and MCD-8 were on orbital tracks that were much faster than astronomers and scientists might have expected by studying other systems like Rho Theta or Bione. MCD had no gas giants. All of its outer planets were small and rocky with largely frozen surfaces and poisonous atmospheres. For any ten surveys performed by automated probes, seven of them had at least three of the four outer planets within the same 25-degree sector. M. Seti-8 was unique in that it had been pulverized over the eons by asteroid impacts. Its upper surface was riddled with craters, some as much as two and three miles deep. Tectonic activity had done the rest, leaving the outer crust of the planet run through with tunnels, unstable caverns, and geological features. Humans and Proximans thought this was a grand state of affairs, so they built automated geothermal energy and fuel processing plants on the surface. It didn't take long for the Sarn to discover the human treachery, and the astro-political die was cast. The Empire didn't have a problem with automated power generators on M City 8. They just preferred they be controlled by the rightful owners. So the Sarn commandeered them. The only thing that had protected the facilities from simply being blown to pieces up to now was the fact they were an unholy pain to get at. That combined with the famous Sarn priority of choosing direct conflict instead of bombing small, out-of-the-way automated bases, had allowed Triton Base and the Galloway Collector Array to continue operating for almost four years under Sarn control. They represented the pinnacle of human achievement, at least when it came to autonomous planetary facilities. They also represented the pinnacle of Sarn aggression. However, at the moment, those achievements were not foremost in the captain's mind. What was foremost was the fact they were reading 68 life forms on M. Seti 8, and 57 of them were Sarn. I do not understand these readings either, Capita, Oakshot said. Our instruments are operating correctly. There should not be anyone down there, but they are domiciled near the Galloway storage matrix. Where the water recapture tanks are located, Hunter muttered. But how? Don't the Sarn know they're there? Oakshot's expression was as stunned as Hunter's. Maybe they had permission, Moo said. 
Maybe they're fugitives. At any rate, we have to get down on the ground first. We can't just orbit the planet and hope we don't trip a scanner buoy or some other inconvenient device. Agreed, Capita. Pilot, take us in. Find the Triton landing platform and set us down there. At once, Lord Oakshot. Hunter pulled Moo aside. The two officers stepped into a side cabin and Hunter closed the door. Colonel, you and I both know the rules of engagement. We can't set off a potentially dangerous diversion if it's going to put others in danger. Especially if those others are civilians. You think those life signs are something other than Sarn regulars? I think it's a colony, and based on what we've seen and heard so far, I wouldn't be surprised if it is populated by separatists. You just love making things complicated, don't you? Moo said with a sarcastic twang. Think about it. If they know the Empire is coming after their first settlement, the forward thinkers are going to come up with a plan B. The small numbers here are exactly what you'd expect. There are 60,000 Sarn civilians on M-74. This group is probably the crazy doomsday bunch who saw disaster coming and decided to get out of the way. Naturally, they were right. The world burner probably isn't going to come all the way out here to blow up a few water tanks and a steam engine. Hunter nodded. Especially if it's already ostensibly controlled by the Sarn. Mu rolled his eyes and opened the hatch. Now we have to evacuate Sarn civilians. Just another day in the fleet. The Bree Saw Yen rocketed through M. Seti 8's ghostly, opaque atmosphere, leaving a strangely beautiful blue trail of fire behind her. The sloop's heavier than usual battle screens did a magnificent job of igniting anything even remotely flammable within a quarter mile of the ship's re entry course. The almost lightless conditions 12 degrees past the Terminator made the trail look even more eerie. Finally, the Royal Proximan sloop exploded out of the upper atmosphere and emerged from the visibility ceiling at 19 miles altitude. The surface of the planet was a menagerie of frozen rock separated by rivers of molten nickel, copper, and zinc. As soon as the navigational computer aboard the Proximan ship was able to synchronize its visual bearings, it provided the pilot with a least-time aerial course to the Triton complex. Estimating landing platform in four minutes, Lord Capita. All right, gentlemen, gear up, weapons tight. Nobody fires without my direct orders. Clear? Hunter said with a sharp expression. We're here to prevent a war, not start one. Aye, Captain, Moo replied. We advance in squad order. Objective destination is main control, which is two levels down on a 070. Affirmative? The Marines all responded with eyes as they checked their anti-electronic surfaces, armor, and weapons. The Proximans naturally had their own environmental suits and helmets, Hunter could never get over the sight of a giant carnivorous warrior feline's face inside an exo-helmet. There was something about it that just didn't fit the ideal image of the mighty warrior of the jungle. At the same time, he had seen these cats fight before. It was something he was rather certain the other humans weren't prepared for. He had noticed more than a few glances by the marines at the Proximans and each other. They were probably wondering why their comrades carried no projectile weapons of any kind. They were only armed with swords and knives. If fighting broke out, Hunter was certain all would become clear to them soon. The agile Proximan sloop slid into a least-time approach to the Triton platform. Its powerful counter-grav engine array roared and shuddered in the howling windstorm. Its landing lights snapped on as it broke 200 feet. Stark white circles bathed the uneven surfaces around the platform. All the base lights were active, which told Hunter the auto systems hadn't been tampered with. Despite the fact Triton was designed to operate without human control, it retained all the amenities humans expected so as to facilitate repair crews, survey and maintenance workers, and emergency operations. Ground stations represented a significant investment of time and capital, even for a civilization as advanced and efficient as the Core Alliance. There was nothing to be gained by squeezing pennies in the morning if it meant lighting dollars on fire to make dinner. The captain closed the faceplate on his own armor and did a quick check of his Atmas, Comlink, and TK-10. The loading hatch on one side of the sloop slid open. Lieutenant Waterford bounded out of the ship and moved powerfully to the wide steps leading down towards the main platform outside the sealed facility. His sword was drawn, and his bearing made him look as if he were on a razor's edge, ready to spring in any direction to do battle on an instant's notice. He gestured to the other Proximans. They filed out, weapons drawn, and followed the lieutenant down the steps. Oakshot was the last Proximan out. He guarded the formation's rear. Moo and the Argent Marines followed. 
The phrase silent but deadly crossed Hunter's mind as he watched the practiced precision of Lieutenant Waterford's advance. He moved with quick strength, peering inside windows every ten feet or so. Occasionally he stopped the column at corners, cleared the unseen area, then allowed the group to advance again. The captain began making plans to recruit the proximate officer. It was clear he would always be a valuable asset in a fight. Movement! One of Moody's techs stopped, examining his handheld. The rest of the column froze, weapons ready. I've got unidentified life forms advancing on a 216. I have a mobile energy source bearing 280, range 200 yards. Oak shot to Yen. Lift off, remain on station, and stand by for further orders. Affirmative, Capita, came the electronic reply. Hunter heard the rumbling sound of the sloop's liftoff engines even over the thundering winds. Light swept across the building as the ship banked away into the obscuring darkness. An instant later, a ground-based weapon of some kind flashed into the obscuring swirl of smoke and ash. Weapons fire! Someone was shouting on the comlink, but Hunter couldn't make out the words. All of Colonel Moody's Marines had taken up fixed firing positions on the metal staircase overlooking the main level of the Triton facility. The colonel raced down the steps towards the platform with his rangefinders, hoping to get a better look at the firing position of the unknown weapon. Yen, status. No impact, sir. We have moved out of range. Very well. Continue evasive maneuvers. Take no offensive action without my orders. Oak shot out. Finally, Moo reached the main platform. Approximately sixty yards ahead, he saw the murky shape of Waterford's power armor moving rapidly up a second metal staircase. It appeared there was a second platform along the edge of the Triton main control structure. There was a strobing flash of white light. Moo heard a muffled scream. Two of the Proximan Blade warriors rushed forward to their lieutenant's aid. When Moo finally got within range, he froze and watched in a combination of shock and breathless wonder. Whatever they were, they had environmental and ground combat technology equal to the Proximans. What they didn't have was four thousand years of swordcraft. One of the stocky creatures leveled a short power rifle at Waterford and opened fire as the vanguard officer bounded up the steps. Waterford's blade whirled and slashed. Semi-transparent waves of disruptive energy appeared momentarily around the Proximan officer, obviously generated by Waterford's sword. They looked like flying wisps of delicate cloth made of light, but they were anything but soft. Each time the enemy's energy bolts impacted one of them, it exploded and vanished. He can deflect enemy weapons fire with a sword? Moo had to wonder if someone had put something in his coffee at breakfast. What happened next was just as miraculous. A second enemy appeared and drew on the lieutenant. The proximate officer slashed the open air with his weapon and unleashed a semicircular wave of energy that slammed into both of the bugbear-like creatures like a bomb had gone off. The first slipped and thumped down the stairs feet first. Its weapon clattered off the platform and fell into the darkness. The other Proximans leaped up the stairs and joined in a close blade-cutting melee with the alien fire team. One tried to regain its feet only to find the sword in Waterford's hands was as sharp as it was advanced. Two ruthless slashes later and the first two alien soldiers were neutralized. Oakshot and Hunter arrived on the scene just in time to see the last attacker's neck ripped by a Proximan blade. The man-portable anti-atmospheric weapon they had fired at the Brisaw Yen told the rest of the story. It wasn't alien in origin. It was a standard Skywatch design. It occurred to Hunter they might have found some kind of armory on the surface, but that would have been a violation of both Skywatch regulations and standard operating procedures for energy production facilities. Triton had no garrison or military guard. Without some kind of Skywatch jurisdiction, it would be highly unusual for military weapons to be stored on the surface, to say nothing of man-portable anti-atmospheric energy weapons. The gear the aliens were using had come into service only a few years prior. It was identical to what Colonel Moody's squads equipped. Hunter examined one of the creature's bodies and rapidly concluded their temperatures were much lower than expected. A viscous liquid was seeping out of one of their environmental suits. The captain examined it with the sensors on his Atmas unit. 34 degrees. It's like liquid ice, but there are no crystals in it. Strange, Oakshot said. Seems similar to medical compounds used to suspend mixtures in a laboratory. We've used something like this as a saline solution before. Might explain the fact these guys are walking around in industrial freezers, Moo said. Those suspension compounds don't have the same freezing point as water. 
Hunter nodded as he snapped his handheld shut. They can get much colder. He stood. We need to get inside and investigate. Corporal, I want a full sweep of these creatures and a biological profile compiled. If any more of them break our defensive perimeter, we need to be ready. Yes, sir. Colonel, let's move out.